Hello, and welcome to Radical Engagements here at Barn Blog. And today I am covering reflections on Mark Fisher's essay on, on capitalist realism by the international communist tendency, or the internationalist communist tendency. Now, I am in dangerous territory venturing into an unspecifically signed polemic by a hypersectarian left communist organization that I'm sure would denounce me. But because I find some of their insights somewhat useful, I'm going to go into it. But let's talk about the internationalist communist tendency. The internationalist communist tendency is a political international whose member organizations identify with the Italian left communist tradition. It comes out of the International Bureau for Revolutionary Party in 1983 as a joint initiative by the ICP, Battaglia Communista in Italy, and the Communist Workers Organization in Britain. It's affiliated with the International Workers Group in the United States and Gruppe International Social Socialists in uh, the GIS in Germany. I think it may be France. Um, what's its what's its belief as a tendency? Okay. Um, it has the following political precepts. <laughs> One. The October Revolution was a proletarian revolution, and um, the, rec the, the recognition of the break with social democracy of the brought by the first two Congresses of the Third International was legitimate. Uh, rejection of all forms of state capitalism and self-management, so co-ops aren't good enough. Rejection of so-called socialist and so-called communist parties as bourgeois, a.k.a. the left of capital. Rejection of all policies which subjects the proletariat to the national bourgeoisie, such the rejection of all national liberation movements, an orientation towards the organization of revolutionaries recognizing Marxist doctrine and methodology as, as proletarian science. I'm not quite sure that I understand what that means, but that's something I believe. And recognition of the international meeting as part of the work with debate amongst revolutionary groups for the coordination of their active political intervention towards the class and struggle with the aims of of contributing to the process of the International Party of the Proletariat and Inspitable Political Org for the guidance of revolutionary class and movements itself. So, the International Communist uh, Tendency, the Internationalist Communist Tendency is separate from the International Communist Current, the Revolutionary Socialist Party, Socialism or Barbarism, Communist Workers Party of Germany, Communist Workers International, and the various other left communist organizations. Um, it seems to come out of the Italian Arbidigas uh, left communist orientation, so um, take that as you will. Now, for those of you who that just seems like a bunch of babble, if you don't know the debates within left communism, it kind of is. Um, and I've done prior episodes on left communism, and you can go look at them. But we're going to just look at this actual polemic here. This will also be in the show notes. All right. Reflections of Mark Fisher's essay on Capitalist Realism by the ICT. Fisher's book on Capitalist Realism remains a popular reference point for many would-be anti-capitalists in the UK, and as such, we have decided to translate the new review from our comrades in Italy, where the book has only been recently published. You can also see our, our reviews of Inventing the Future, Post-Capitalism and World Without Work, and Post-Capitalism and Guide to the Future by authors from a similar milieu. We noticed that Marx Fisher's text, Capital's Realism, There is No Alternative, is creating a lot of interest in younger generations in Italy. Written in English in 2009, but only translated into Italian last year, which I'm guessing that was around two, uh, 2019. The booklet aims to be a manual for the, the perfect anti capitalist of the new minimalism millennium. Motive enough for us to provide the reader in such a real anti capitalist perspective of a of a small critical rereading of the work. We won't draw on the biography of the author who committed suicide in January 2017, although it is available online. 
Getting to the point, from a revolutionary point of view, the text makes some interesting observations, but also contains some remarkable weaknesses. And we will try to show both by retracting the author's narrative of capitalist realism, following him chapter by chapter. One, it is easier to manage the end of the world than the end of capitalism. The film Children of Men serves to launch as a reflection about totalitarianism, which is still an increase today, despite, even though, the persistence of the democratic form. Quote, the authoritarian measure that is everywhere in place has been implemented within a political structure that remains notion notionally democratic, unquote. That's Fisher's text. I always thought that, that, that starting this with media criticism was always bizarre. Um, and this was a trend in left thought for a while. It seems to finally be dying down. Um, where you get to a point about political economy and politics in general from cultural criticism. It's always struck me as weird, and it's something that Zero Books was particularly given to, even when I was an editor there. So make of that what you will. All right. The critical reader, therefore, understands that this is about us, about our era. Quote, the normalization of the crisis produces a situation in which the repealing of the measures brought into a deal with an emergency becomes unimaginable. Yeah. I mean, the children of men came out post 9-11 is n not without import but it is always true that in some ways science fiction both reflects the current but also like doesn't truly reflect the current anyway for the author capitalist realism is defined as quote the widespread sense that not only capitalism is the only viable political and economic system but also that it's now impossible to even imagine a coherent alternative to it blimey this is precisely the point. It is necessary to overturn a narrative of the dominant ideology to affirm that this is not only, not only, not the only possible world, but the worst of all worlds. I don't know that it's the worst, but it's pretty bad. That's Varn talking. Okay, but let's continue. And the film Children of Men, still thinking as key to understanding the present, quote, there is no withering away of the state, only a stripping back of the state to its core military and police functions. Exactly. Yet on the other hand, this is essentially a starting point for us Marxists. The state is always institutional expression of oppression of the ruling classes over the dominated class. The emergency issue resonates more loudly today in light of the COVID-19 crisis. It is here that revolutionaries usually analyze causes and consequences in order to bring a possible revolutionary strategy to light. Fisher, on the other hand, makes a different choice. He avoids analysis and strategy and focuses on the experience of anguish that this situation induces in the individual, aware that the future, quote, the future only harbors rate iteration and repermutation, question mark, of what currently exists. Okay, Fisher, then let's throw ourselves into the abyss of despair and nonsense produced by capitalism in order to draw from it pointers at how it could be mapped out in a revolutionary way. For the author, the anxiety produced by this distressing perspective, or rather the absence of perspective, produces a sort of bipolar oscillation between messianic hopes and the belief that nothing new will ever seriously happen. Asterisk. And I think this actually shows up in Fisher's later concessions to social democracy. I've said this now multiple times, but I think that's what this actually ends up implying. A kind of rapid oscillation between hopelessness and political fatalism, not even determinism, um, and milk toast volunteerism of the kind of most useless variety. But that's my perspective. Let's see what the ICT has to say on this. We will pass over the only quotation from Marx from the manifesto in the book and go to the monster definition because capitalism is for Fincher a monster like the thing of John Carpenter. Quote, monstrous, infinitely plastic entity capable of metabolizing and absorbing anything which it comes into contact. Okay, but maybe we can characterize capitalism a little better as a system of class exploitation, money, and private property. But no, there is nothing of the sort. Capitalism is never fine, yet it would have been useful. This is true about the way both capitalism and neoliberalism often get thrown around in these texts without their clear definitions and given causal agency without their clear definitions, which is a hypostatization error. But anyway, again, that's far in talking. Let's go back to the text. Let's be patient and carry on with the journey into the existential acts produced by the monster that engulfs everything by projecting us into an internal and insubstantial present. The comparison with Fukuyama's end of history is inevitable. Yes, it is. Uh, not only because history really ended 
not only because history really really did in 1989, but because, quote, this idea ended up being accepted and integrated on an unconscious cultural level. It is from the 1980s that Fisher traces the assertion that ca of capitalist realism, which can largely be imposed on what other called neoliberalism, but therefore, Fisher isn't that, in the end, what you theorize an unrealistic capitalism? Like, the critics of neoliberalism who only want capitalism with a human face, let's hope not as we are as we carry on reading. Ultimately, I think that is kind of what Fisher wanted when he started at when he wrote The Vampire Castle and I published it all those years ago. Now over a decade ago. We have now arrived at the turning point of 1984. Thatcher defeated the British miners by affirming the doctrine of Tina, there is no alternative. Then socialist realism collapsed and capitalist realism turned out to be the sole ruler of the world. Well, a couple of words might be needed to explain that the USSR was not socialist but state capitalist. Asterisk. Yeah, and again, you're going to need to define that for me, ICT, but go ahead. And you could add the imperialist and anti-proletarian, too. Okay. It is by no accident that capitalism professes to be a unique and inseparable system precisely because of its claim that the communist opponent has been defeated. But we could clarify all this by stating that communism has nothing to do with it. But he doesn't. Especially since, quote, it is true that for most people under the age of 20, the absence of an alternative to capitalism is not even a problem anymore. Capitalism simply occupies the whole horizon of the thinkable. Unquote. Of course, if we are anti-capitalist, we also turn our backs on gigantic falsification that was the USSR. I don't think we can... This is where I'm talking. While I'm not a USSR booster as a society that I think we should model any future versions of socialism on, nor that I think it achieved what it was supposed to achieve to meet the minimum state as stated even in the stages variety of critique of the Goethe program, I do think its collapse actually ended up being worse for the world. So make that what you will. But here Fisher has already gone off in another direction. He goes off to reflect on how at a cultural level, quote, the occupation by capitalism of the whole imagination means that alternative and independent do not denote something foreign to official culture. If anything, they are simply styles internal to the mainstream are better they are, at this point, the dominant styles of the mainstream, unquote. Fisher now makes it clear. Anti-capitalism developed through a counterculture that has grown up inside the system in the post-Second World War period. In fact, the first chapter ends with Kurt Cobain's suicide. Quote, Kurt Cobain's death confirmed a defeat in incorporation of rock's utopian and Promethean ambitions. Ah. Well, we might have total respect for rock, but we don't believe that Pink Floyd are the Rolling Stones with their large bank accounts ever wanted to represent an example of anti-capitalism. Indeed, we need to look elsewhere for an anti-capitalist stance. Let's see how this book continues to go. What if you held a protest and everyone came? Capitalism, Fisher notes, is capable of absorbing any anti-capitalism. Quote, the role of the capitalist ideology is not to make an explicit case for something in the way of that propaganda does is to conceal the fact that the operations of capital do not depend on any sort of subjectively assumed belief. Capitalism can proceed perfectly well, and in some ways better, with, without anyone making a case for it. We are now into the all-pervasive nature of contemporary dominant ideology on the impersonal, because it is financial character of capital, as well as even if that could be better explained, we are now moving on to the analysis of the anti-globalization movement. The author identifies the reasons for its failure in that, quote, it was unable to posit a coherent alternative political economic model to capitalism and ended up just trying to mitigate its worst excesses. Quote, yeah, except that Fisher himself does this later on. And I think this has been noted now in several essays that I've done about Fisher. Um, that Fisher is guilty of the things he critiques in capitalist realism himself in his writings in, between 2013 and 2016. All right. Agreed. And even if one should have been added that the anti-globalization movement also failed because it missed the opportunity to revive class conflict as a central factor in any possible anti-capitalist change. Fisher has not even mentioned this while claiming that the anti-globalization conflict model had been dominated by the idea of this spectacle on, on the Live 8 model. Fisher's criticism seems moralistic. That is, he always refers to the aesthetics of the problem 
Yet we need to analyze the material cause of the phenomenon from which the problem emerges. In this superficiality, and agree, I'm going to agree with the ICT on this, there is a course of no blame for the individual because, quote, what needs to be kept in mind is both the capitalism's hyper abstract and personal structure and that it has nothing and it is nothing without our cooperation. What that this is also true, but we don't emphasize that it is the producers, the workers, the proletarians who must leverage this dependence of capital on its workforce. We are wandering in a desolate landscape with no prospects. In fact, it is here where Fisher goes on to define capitalism as an abstract parasite, an affected zombie, etc. Never as a social relation based on the exploitation of labor power by capital itself, that is, by its holders, personal and personal, financial. If one if you don't focus on the fact that capital is a given social relationship determined by relations between two social classes and that this is a relationship between classes that allows capital to exist as the most powerful productive force that has ever existed, Fisher, you don't take us very far and you're eventually rest falling into depression. Yeah. Ouch. Ouch. Capitalism in the real. We move on to what should be the ideological ideology of capitalist realism or a kind of quote business ontology in which it's simply obvious that everything in society, including healthcare and education, should be run as a business, unquote. Here and throughout the work, the author seems to identify capitalist realism and neoliberalism, as we've already pointed out, the dangers of this. But let's go on. Where do we locate the, the criticism of all this? In reality, the realism of capitalism does not coincide with the real general interests. So, quote. So one strategy against capitalist realism could be to invoke reals underlying the reality that capitalism presents to us. We have to denounce the false propaganda of bourgeois ideology. We have to contrast reality with capitalist false picture of it. All right. There are three fundamental themes that are proposed here. One, the environmental catastrophe and the need to politicize the ecological battle because, quote, the relationship between capitalism, eco-disasters, and other coincidental or accidental, it's capital's very need to constantly expand the market, its growth fetish, means that capitalism is by its very nature opposed to any notion of sustainability, unquote. Two, mental health and the need for, quote, a politicization of more common disorders. Talk about depression that is spreading, especially among younger generations, stress, anguish, whether than accepting the privatization of stress as in vogue, you're stressed out, it's your fault, take the tablet. One should criticize capitalist origins of these disorders. Three, bureaucracy with the example of progressive bureaucratization of a whole series of tasks such as teaching bureaucratization goes in exactly the opposite direction to the supposed efficiency that it, that it should also pursue. Although the first two themes are of some interest, the third one is less interesting. Would we have to criticize the bureaucracy that does not actually make the system more efficient? There is no mention of the falsification inherent in others, and at least equally dangerous ideologies, such as nationalist ones, that we are all in the same boat. The disappearance of social classes, etc. Politicization of the of, of environmental and mental health issue, that's fine, but what politicization? Fisher does not make this clear. You have to wait for the last two paragraphs of the book. Ouch. Four. Reflexive impotence, immobilization, and liberal communism. Writing about the general disengagement of younger generations, Fisher introduces a category of reflective impotence. The awareness that things are bad and the future black is accompanied by equally clear awareness that, quote, they know they can't do anything about it. Starting from bleak condition, mental health problems, learning difficulties, and depression are rampant. For Fisher, the response is a depressive hedonism. That is, a continuous and desperate search for pleasure to escape the state of anguish awareness. Its complement is hedonistic inertia, the soft narcissist of the PlayStation, of nights of television and marijuana. Quote, ask students to read for more than a couple of sentences and many will protest that they can't do it, that it's boring. A post-literate younger generation, quote, too wired to concentrate. The metaphor remains earphones with their ability to isolate you from the world filling the void. Teachers find themselves trapped in, in the role of facilitator entertainers, but in a world where disciplinary structures have gone into crisis. While whole families are fragmented that everyone must work, the teacher also is delegated to the educational role before the family. The phenomenon is part of a phenomenon extremely widespread in the Anglo-Saxon world of student indebtedness linked in a way by this double threat to, threat to capital. Well, we share the phenomenology of modern desolation that afflicts the younger generations. However, not connecting everything to the most serious and prolonged capitalist crisis in history to the defeat sudden suffered by workers into the possibilities for recovery and to without understanding the ideological world that played by the collapse of the USSR, we do not have the tools to identify an exit perspective, which is to summarize in two words, an anti-capitalist class struggle. 
Without these references, Fisher continues to wander without ideas in the desolation of the present. He affirms in capitalist realism process to oscillate between immobilists, those who oppose this or that law in the name of preservation of the present, of the precedent, and liberal communists, by which he defines the communism that has already been murdered by comparing it with Soros of Bear Gates, who do charity to mitigate the excesses of the system. Here, any puzzling confusion falls on the reader. Any opposition to the flexibility and decentralization risk being self-defeating, resistance to the new is not a cause that the left can and should rally around. From this, we discover, one, the social reference point for Fisher is not the working class, the exploited, but the left. And I think that's true for a whole lot of leftists. Two, the battles versus capital attacks are not the cause, but rather to be embraced. Three, we must accept under good vouchers, flexibility and decentralization. And four, that any hypothesis linking immediate resistance battles to the prospect of a revolutionary, of a revolutionary struggle is inconceivable to Fisher. We could stop here, but let's continue. Not without pointing out that we internationalists do not believe that we belong to the left. Right and left are just different parts of the bourgeois political alignment. This, if you, uh, Astros, have you ever known where that post-left uh, stuff about the left of capital comes from? It actually comes from left communists who are supposed to be the left of communism. My response to this is like, well, w since the USR fell apart, what non-capitalist world are not, you know, are you to the left of? I mean, even given that you believe that the USSR was, was state capitalist, and let's just say that's true. Uh, are you, you know, you're, you're, you're beyond that in some critical way. I get what you're trying to say in that, that you aren't aligned with the, with the left of, of liberalism and it under capital and sure, but You know, we are communist internationalist revolutionaries that are capitalists, not part of the left of capital, except that you ultimately are. You can't just choose to opt out by will like that. When there is an international that existed, being such an internationalist and being to the left of the center of the international would have been meaningful. It's just not the case now. But this is my debate with left communists. It goes back a long time. Until a return to class struggle, Fisher believes that the real problem on the left is that it has not developed a new language. Yeah, I, I thought that a book, I always thought this part, part of capitalist realism was just bizarre, and I thought it even at the time. Having said this, this category of class struggle that has been fought for and won by the rich has finally made its appearance, but only in a quote from David Harvey, quote, the ratio of the median compensation of workers to salaries of CEOs has increased just over 30 to 1 in 1970 to nearly 500 to 1 in 2000, and that's all. Since 1984, the defeat of the British miners, class struggle has suffered something of a defeat and is being lost. This is the impression the reader gets. And we fought class struggle and we lost it, so let's leave it alone and go back to pathological mechanisms of capital to overlook another way. This is the logical thread the author seems to follow. October 6, 1979. Don't let yourself get attached to anything. Comparing the gangster films of Francis Ford Coppola and Martin Scorsese between 1971 and 1990 and Michael Mann's Heat from 1995. And again, notice that Fisher keeps on using movies to make points about political economy in ways that I just don't think actually, I don't think, I never thought that was a sound analytical move. <laughs> But it did make it relatable, I guess, if you have to relate everything to media criticism. Fisher points out how the values that keep criminal gangs together in the 1970s, namely family, roots, traditions, etc., are exactly those that are deemed to be obsolete in 1995, contrary to the Fordist rigidity to Ford post Fordism and flexibility just in time. In this way, Fisher, uh, this is Varn talking, in this way, Fisher is actually a lot like the new left who, um, don't, like, go into to a kind of reactive defense of Fordism while critiquing its rigidity. The moment that they realize that what they've argued for, what we should develop at a capital that's far different than what they mean. For Fisher, it is a conflict between wanting reassuring stability of the old forms of work, organization on one hand, and the modern job insecurity on the other, which is massively produced by polar disorder and schizophrenia phenomenon which increasingly widespread among workers is is bipolar disorder and schizophrenia increasingly widespread among workers i don't know about that that's a big claim and you'd have to provide me evidence for it 
But while we identify the origins of evil in class feet, the only possible medicine in the resumption of class struggle until revolutionary instance, Fisher merely observes that it is capitalism itself that is bipolar, and that leaps between the expansion and crisis and can only be reflected in the minds of the worker. Yeah, this stuff about Fisher has always driven me nuts. Um, the use of medicalization categories to, and also demedicalizing them and remedicalizing them simultaneously and using them as path it just always seemed to me irresponsible, both as political economy and as psychology. Depressed capitalism, depressed workers, expanding capitalism, happy workers. Okay, but this is close to banality. This is what the text says. Fisher identifies some factors actually acting today, such as blaming the suffering subject. You are sick because your brain chemistry, not because the system is rotten, because quote, you are the only one to blame. He rightly observes that all this brings good business to the pharmaceutical multinationals, but what does he propose? Repoliticizing mental illness? I mean, we also agree, but the prospect of revolutionary anti-capitalism class struggle must support it, must support it do not develop. What repolitization are we talking about? It is not yet known. Yeah, I don't know either, and I'm not sure it actually fixes all the problems of bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, <laughs> frankly. Six, all that style of melts into PR and Marcus Stalinism and bureaucratic anti-production. post fordism brings about a new guilty models of worker evaluation, which we will not describe here. These models would underline many pathologies expressed above. Quote, really existing capitalism is marked by the same division which characterized really existing socialism. Between, on one hand, an official culture in which capitalist enterprises are presented as socially responsible and caring, and on the other hand, a widespread awareness that companies are actually corrupt, ruthless, etc. Still no criticism of Soviet state capitalism. I mean, you'd have to define Soviet state capitalism here, and I don't. you haven't done it in this polemic, but I'm assuming that since the ICT, this is for an internal audience, that they already agree on their definition. All right. Indeed, it seems to him that the real socialism and there that it is real socialism and therefore does not work. The whole tirade against bureaucracy that follows, drawing on Kafka, thus has a liberal aftertaste. It is well and good to criticize the psychology of the controls who turn to become the controllers, but the author proposes no alternative. You can see that he too, in reality, is not able to see beyond capitalism and to suggest that it can be overcome, but he puts puts a doubt in the reader's mind that Fisher, in reality, is also a victim and therefore part of a capitalist realism. Seven. If you if you can watch the overlap one reality with the other, capitalist realism is a dream work and memory disorder. In capitalist realism, there would be no other possible form of life other than acceptance of the existent without questions that, if asked, would expose the subject to madness. Quote. What begins to emerge as some deeper, and more fundamental constitution of postmodernity itself, at least in its temporal dimension, is henceforth where everything now submits itself to perpetual change of fashion and media image that nothing can know, nothing can change any longer. Fisher quoting Frederick Jameson. Fisher seems to denounce the horror here, but in reality, on closer introspection, he's already taken it as an immutable fact. Quote. Meanwhile, neoconservative strong state was confined to the military and police function and defined it itself against a welfare state held to undermine individual moral responsibility, unquote. In closing the author, instead of looking towards the opening of a perspective and criticism of meaning and capable of revealing possible paths towards an anti-capitalist action, difficult by definition precisely because it's definite to develop the, amid a thousand difficulties, instead of doing that, what does he do? He returns to the totalizing despotism of children and men. After so much meandering that he still found no possible way, not just of attack, but also of resistance. Indeed, resistance seems to be avoided due to the immobility. The black curtain is about to fall. There is no central exchange. The system presents itself as an impersonal, quote, the blame will be put on the supposedly pathological individual, those, quote, abusing the system rather than the system itself. Companies and corporations are themselves expressions and products of, quote, the ultimate cause that is not a subject of capital. In a nutshell, we are victims of, interpersonal ca of impersonal capitalism, a dense plot that takes away the reference points, and this is the meshes between the lines. Probably every battle is destined to end in defeat, and even then the system will, will make us feel that even in defeat, it is our fault. The Marxist super nanny. So what now? Please, Fisher, we've followed you so far. Tell us something usefully revolutionary. We need to look at the structural causes that produce the same repeated effect. Okay, we agree. Quote, so let's go back to Spinoza. Spinoza? 
Yeah, this is a thing. Freedom Spinoza shows us something that can be achieved only when apprehended the real cause of our actions and when we set aside the sad passions that intoxicate and trance us. No, sorry, Fisher, but what said pa what sad passions? Life is really difficult here. Precariousness, unemployment, crisis, coronavirus. We must ask, what is to be done? Quote, a certain amount of stability is necessary for cultural vibrancy. The question is to be asked, how can this stability be provided? Ellipses. It must mean recognizing the goal of generally new left should not take over the state, but subordinate the state to the general will. Ellipses. Reviving and modernizing the idea of public space. The subordination of the bourgeois state to the general will. But you said earlier that the shapeless monster engulfs everything. Modernize the idea of public space, obviously without going through the revolution, which is never even mentioned in the entire book, and you have just described a dynamic that goes exactly in the opposite direction. And as to stability, it is obvious that in capitalism's permanent crisis, there is no stability possible anymore. The author replies, quote, All that is real is the individual and their families. The symptom of the failures of this worldview are everywhere. We need, ellipses, we need to reassert that far from being isolated, contingent problems, these are the all the effects of a single systemic cause, capital. Okay, are we proposing that the anti-capitalist class struggle also because a crisis is advancing, the system could soon falter, and we have two centuries of experience of the class struggle to draw on in order to emerge victorious this time? No, Fisher replies, quote, we need, to be, we need to begin, as for the first time, to develop strategies against capital, which presents itself as ontologically as well as geographically ubiquitous. But what strategies? Quote, ellipses what we need to what we need to be left behind is a certain romantic attachment to the politics of failure to the comfortable position of a defeated marginality well, what are you doing you haven't gotten a shred of proposal to offer and now you insult us he answers it is crucial a generally revitalized left confidently occupies a new political terrain ellipses what is needed is a new struggle over the work and who controls it an assertion of work autonomy as a coast controlled by management together with the rejection of certain kinds of labor. What is needed is strategic overall of the forms of labor, which will only be noticed by management. As to an anti-capitalist perspective, only deafening silence. We put ourselves in the heads of young readers who brought the booklet, among other things, well laid out, looking for a perspective to fight against capitalism. They find in their hands and wonder, but now what do we do? If you have not understood it well, we will tell you better from the extract from an interview which, with Fisher himself. Quote, but I think we can be confident that these, quote, 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 things are related. Now a new wave. There could not have been a Corbin without Syriza. And if Corbin is crushed, something else will emerge later. There's a new wave and we can start, now start to ride it towards post-capitalism. A speech by Mark Fisher on February 23rd, 2016, London 11 months before his suicide. You can find it on YouTube. Vote for the least bad option in order to move towards post-capitalism. That's Fisher's perspective. An author, together with his bar, Zizek, offers nothing as revolutionary. No materials analysis, no definition of capitalism, a class struggle, a structural crisis we are experiencing, no anti-capitalist perspective, and indeed, a certain snobbish contempt for those who have instead identified revolutionary and anti-capitalist militancy as the only real medicine for the evils induced by capitalism. Let's end it here. If Cobain's death confirmed the defeat and incorporation of rock's utopian and Panuthian ambition, Fisher's suicide reaffirms the real powerlessness of any perspective of criticism of capitalism that's not based on solid pillars, such as the criticism of political economy. The materialist conception of history, the experience of past class struggles and communist revolutionary program that derives from them. Marx already warned us in his um 11 thesis on Feuerbach. Philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways on very badly. Editor, the point is to change it. Lotus, April 2nd, 2020. Now, I think that last dig about Fisher's suicide is slightly low because I don't know how much we can tie Fisher's suicide to its politics, but I do think there's a real sense in which Fish, Fisher's radical analysis was so, struct, was so astructural that he just kept on hoping that, in, that basically reformist politics was a way to return politics to joy. And it never did so. Now, I've gone over two essays that critique Fisher on this, and this is my way of constituting my own relationship with him. I don't mean to kick a man when he's dead, but there is a way in which Fisher's turn from 
this critique of the nebulous capitalist realism and his ultra globalization stuff to a kind of reformist, you know, populism where he was defending Russell Brand, etc., was actually a movement that was defined by a refusal to look at things in a structural way as opposed to a cultural one. And he rejected attempts to impose structures. I mean, he, uh, my biggest debate with him when he was alive was what the definition of class was and how I kept on saying like class habitus isn't determining like that. It's important. It's important for your individual experience. It's important for your subjective realities. It's important for the kind of mental health crisis that Fisher was talking about. But it's not the finding relationship and capital. And I didn't think Fisher always even agreed with other Marxists. Or I mean, he wasn't really a consistent Marxist. He flirted with it sporadically. Um, with, with other, you know, anti-capitalist thinkers, they couldn't hack it. They couldn't figure out, like you know, where to go. And frankly, a lot of their critiques were taken from them from the right, from the populist right. Only to see that their allegiances with with the liberal left left them over open to not so much betrayal as strategic removal. What do you have to do now? This is not to demean everything Fisher saw. Um, I think he was insightful for his time. I'm going back and reading a lot of the left stuff from the aughts right now. I'm doing a series on David Graper's aughts writings, not the stuff that made him famous later. And I'm going back to put myself in the mindset of the left that I encountered in my 20s as opposed to what I see now in my 40s. You know, um, I think we're going to have to deal with that. It's going to take a lot to deal with it. We'll see how it all goes. Uh, I, I kind of like most of this ICT essay. That's why I did it. I don't. Um, I guess it is signed by Lotus, um, and it is very much in an Italian compact uh, uh, milieu. But I do think you know there's a couple liberals in it, and there there are specifically. Italian left communist framework said I wish were more defined here because they're just taken as a given. And that's a lot of my problem with a lot of left communism is they seem to take their sectarian stances as inherently obvious. Um, I don't know. Make of that what you will. Um, I think this is the last thing I want to do uh, on Fisher. Like I said, I'm not so happy with the with the ending there, but um, maybe people shouldn't use suicides as symbolic of shit. Just saying. Like and subscribe, hit the bell, etc.